They are Adil Aziz and Praneet Kapula. Uh, Adil is a front-end engineer at Bang the Table, same place that uh, Jason Justice from yesterday works at, right? Jason works with you guys, right? Um, uh, and he has a special interest in UX, UI design. He was fortunate enough to have his first computer at a very young age. Yeah, dude. Uh, we're very jealous. We're all jealous. Uh, and learned, uh, learned, uh, and he learned more and more about him by breaking it and fixing it. Uh, he's a free software evangelist and a strong supporter of them. Uh, outside of that, he's a movie buff, music lover, and an aspiring writer. Uh, Praneet Kapula is a daily design thinker, weekend cook, and occasional photographer. After an engineering degree, he has dabbled in the design world, uh, researching technology products for the underserved design interfaces and services. He has worked at both large organizations and startups. He's evangelized for UX and setting up UX teams. And he currently heads the UX team at Bang the Table. Uh, so the designer-developer combo of Praneet and Adil, uh, they'd like to tell you about some experiences that they had by building and rebuilding an app with AngularJS. Guys, the floor is yours. Okay, now? Okay, awesome. Hello? Uh, so yeah, we are here to share our story of the experience of building a complex web app entirely in AngularJS. Why AngularJS, how that happened in just a minute, but uh, so first a context to this complex web app that we talk about. Engagement HQ is one of our primary product offerings from Bang the Table. Uh, it's a platform for community engagement used by over 200 clients, primarily in the government sector in markets like Australia, New Zealand and Canada. They use this uh, platform essentially to share information, listen to the feedback from the local communities, and then learn from whatever they're hearing and implement that. Uh, so here's an example of uh, Southeast Queensland Water. It's a government body which manages all the lakes uh, in Southeast Queensland. Uh, they've set up this site uh, essentially to talk about the recreational reviews that they're doing in terms of what facilities that they can give to the local communities around like picnic spots around the lakes, and, you know, people can go do horse riding next to the lakes or swimming and all these things. So they have all these big ideas and they wanted feedback from the community in terms of how do they want to go about it. So just a bit about this, the structure is like you have like a information about the project up there. It's like a long page. So down below over there would be the feedback tools. We have like a news feed, quick poll and some surveys running over there. And on the right are the widgets that support this information. So this is like the platform in action. Now, imagine what this would be in a mobile browser, right? It's like a crappy zoom in and zoom out experience every time you have to go in and do something over this. And we did notice a spike in our user base in a span of 12 months. So somewhere around June 2012, we had like 10% of the end users uh, accessing these sites across all the sites from mobile phones. And that started going up to about 20%. And that's when we said, you know, we need to do something about our mobile experience for the end users. A uh, bunch of us got into a room, started brainstorming. End of the day, we came up with this paper prototypes. And then we were like, okay, we had no clue in terms of how we are going to do this, but this is our experience, vision of the experience of what we want to provide. Little Adil in the corner of the office takes a look at it and says, oh, you need an app-like experience on the browser. Uh, it needs to be responsive fast. I've been experimenting with AngularJS. Let me take a shot at it. I, 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 and he actually convinced us that he can actually build it all up alone. And we said, okay, great. Go ahead, man. And well, it did turn out well. In 26 days, we had a go back. Yeah, in 26 days, we had we demoed this at CWIT Australia. Uh, yeah, we rebuilt it again by 86 days. We had the final launch. It actually went live a couple of weeks back. Uh, but yeah, how did this whole experience go about? Uh, so this is the graph uh, that Ben Nadel, a famous front-end engineer who blogs went about mapping his emotions as he went about building the AngularJS app, right? So what he talks about as you start using it, you know, it's like, oh, nice, that's so cool. And then the very next day, you're like, man, this is so lame. I should go back to my backbone or the usual uh, uh, stack that I have. And then, you know, ups and downs, mood swings and all. And we are no strangers to this. So let me stop here and ask how many guys have actually dabbled into AngularJS or used AngularJS in your, right? How many guys experienced this mood swings? Right, exactly. A few of you, and this is, we were also the same. 
And a little story over here, Adil one day at 11.30 in the morning, we have our usual team uh, huddles, he's nowhere to be seen. I call him up, he sounded so depressing, I thought, okay, well, he's having his angular day. And, <laughs> right, in the night, a bunch of us, we are locking up the office, we are stepping out, probably catch some dinner and then head home. We see Ang uh, Adil step out of an uh, auto, fresh as a daisy. You know, he's figured it out, he's going to hack all night over in AngularJS now. So, yeah, those were the kind of days that we had in this 86 days. So, uh, so let me, let, we'll go through some of the product requirements, how AngularJS helped us and what we went about it. So, uh, this is like a basic infrastructure, uh, information architecture for our uh, sites that our uh, clients use. So, essentially it's a website or in community engagement terms, a consultation hub which has multiple projects running in it, each which is called a consultation and each one of those will have these feedback tools and widgets and all and sometimes even the consultation hub might have widgets and tools. Uh, so what we are talking about is essentially like nested views and the ability to conditionally change behavior of the template in the views. Uh, so Adil, how did, so, how did we do this? Yeah, as Pranit said, we wanted to have parallel views and nested views and in some cases we wanted to uh, Excuse me, sir. Not audible. Where is the mic? Okay. I think I'll take it out. So yeah, now good. Yes. So what we wanted was, uh, you know, conditionally change certain templates. Let's say, uh, in so when you go to certain URL, you want the header to be different, or uh, you want in certain cases the entire thing changes into a something different layout. So we wanted all that. So first we, and in some cases we also wanted to attach certain data uh, to a particular URL or a route. So our first choice was to use dollar route, the default Angular service in, you know, Angular routing service in Angular code. And we tried it uh, to have these parallel views and all, but it all started getting a little bit nasty because there is, uh, you have, you will have be forced to write a lot of conditions in your views and and even the angular ways that you embrace using logics in views sometimes, but this was like getting, getting too complex. And we started to look for alternatives and then we eventually stumbled upon Angular UI router. Angular UI is a independent project from um, Angular, so they have this uh, libraries and all those stuff which will help with you, your Angular project. So this Angular UI router is basically a state-based routing uh, framework. So what it will let you do is that it will let you organize the various parts of your interface uh, into a state machine. So here in, in this state machine, a state is essentially a place or uh, a, a place in your user interface in terms of overall, you know, um, navigations and various states that, or various states that a user could go to when it do some actions. Yeah, and you can also attach views and uh, various behavior and optionally give it a URL and when user go to that URL or when the state in that state machine get activated in, in an implicit way when they go to the URL or when user take an action, what happens is that in this, this uh, state appends its templates and URL to the layout, right? So uh, I think I will go back to the code and show you how we So this is app.coffee, uh, what it is, uh, it's, it boot, bootstrap your Angular application. So here you can see the configuration file, uh, is it readable? So what you can see here is the configuration function and uh, you are essentially injecting state provider which is part of the Angular UI library and you are using the state method to create a state. So it takes two uh, parameters, one is the state name and the other one is an object. Uh, this is how you write an object in CoffeeScript. So this object will have different properties attached to it. It has a URL here and it is resolving some data before loading that and it, uh, I'm giving a string as the template here and I'm also attaching a controller to that. So in this app.coffee what we have and we have a couple of other states as well. So what we are doing in using this uh, root status is uh, factor out all the commonalities in your page. So in most of the page you will be having the same header and same footer, same navigation. So in using this parent status I'm factoring out. It's just like work like a layout manager if you think in that terms, right? And in uh, all these states folder, I have state definition for various tools. 
So if you see for the guest book, what I did is I gave the name as project dot guest book. So what happens is it becomes a parent of guest book state, and I'm also giving a URL to this and and attaching certain data and all. And here, if you can see, I am targeting to a parent state and attaching a template to that and giving a controller. So here, I used template URL and actually loading using you know XHR the file, and it will give. You can alternately use uh, a string as well. And there is one more way which we'll uh, get back to. Yeah. So uh, remember, I talked about the agility in our process, the ability to actually restart the entire thing. Uh, AngularJS had a role to play over there, but essentially when we were looking at all the product requirements, we saw there were a lot of patterns that were repeating. Uh, a case in example being the comments. So most of our tools like newsfeed, stories, forums, guestbook all had uh, comments and even a tool like uh, Q&A where people ask questions and site admin can answer them, it was essentially submitting a comment and therefore you're getting it. So we were talking about, you know, how could we uh, use some of the reusability features of AngularJS and get things done much faster. And uh, Adil will show you a couple of ways of how you could achieve this. So what we, as Pranay said, what we essentially want is to reuse the same controller and views in various routes. So all these features will be having this comment functionality. Let's say question and answers have this. Uh, it's similar to comments. So you, so you want to change such, certain stuff in some cases, right? So if you go to the uh, survey or uh, sorry a forum it may not be as exactly as this this uh, implementation guestbook so you still want to change some part of this controller views but you still want to reuse certain stuff so how you do that so we figured out it is basically generate you want to generate dynamically some state objects which will use all these things but one thing one implementation thing we couldn't figure out at first was where will i put this state generator function i want something uh, which is injectable to configuration function so what the solution we found is that we wrote a uh, custom provider uh, called state generators. But what, here in this case, what all does a project manager has to do, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so here in this case, uh, uh, we are only injecting this provider, this custom provider, uh, to the configuration function of your application, like app dot config. But it, so if we, since we are not uh, injecting this to any other parts. So any other controllers or any other services, we don't have, we don't need dollar get method to do anything here. And what this function do is that it takes all these parameters: what is the URL, what is the heading, and what data, what the, what is the function which resolves the, all the data, which and what is the placeholder, and various state things, so that we can change stuff depending on that. So I'm attaching some custom data here. I'm also resolving them data. And uh, so remember, I said how we can load templates in this state. So First, you was using template property where you can just give a string, and the second way is uh, using template URL. The third way is to essentially you get to a template provider. What it do is that it it gives you a function which is injectable. So I'm injecting HTTP service and all those things, and depending on certain condition, I'm loading different views here. So I'm targeting to the project frame, which is a layout for all these project views, and in the head region, right? And in this head region. Um, I'm loading if the user is logged in or if their current user is present. I'm loading this view. In the uh, other case, I'm just loading the generic header. So that in some places you make a, you can get you want a different header for that. Let's say for usability issues, you want to have a submit button on top of your fields. You can do, do this trick. So uh, this is uh, one way which helped us, uh, you know, achieve ensure reusability in our code base. The other way uh, which Angular helped us to ensure usability is uh, using directives, which is very similar to web components, which uh, Chris has explained this morning. So I'll show you uh, some examples before. So here, here in our home page, uh, we have this, you know, in this, this is a basically a photo gallery widget. So we have uh, uh, little thumbnails index of the all the photos present in the database. And you can swipe and drag and all do all those things. And when you open this image, yeah, you you still have that uh, same interface component here, which do the same stuff. So we are using the same thing in video gallery. We have the same pattern in video gallery for ho uh, project homepage and in individual shop page as well. So what we did is, I'll show you the photo show page here. Uh, 
So here you can see that we have a custom HTML uh, element which takes certain um, attributes and this will essentially give us that interface number. So how we do that? So we use directives for that. So if we go back and look at you know gallery panel directive code, you can see I'm restricting this as an element. I have given a certain template for that. And here in this link function, I'm giving all the logic, all the code which needed to do that swipe effect and all those things. How you slide into it, what will happen when you click on that. So all these are given. And I'm also isolating this from the rest of by overriding its scope. So I have this items type and which is a project which is associated with which, you know some uh, API. So you need to know which project it is so that I can load it from API and all. And since video uh, and photo index differs a little, I'm also getting the type as an attribute. So here, this essentially let us reuse the same thing as easy, as expressive as you, how you would write a p tag or h1. All I have to do, everywhere I have to use this, I just write gallery panel and what is it and I just pass in the photos, photos list, right? And uh, uh, actually we can, we actually, we, uh, we had a feature called QuickPoll which lets the users uh, take, uh, conduct words and all. We build out the entire functionality using a directive. So this is QuickPoll. So why we wanted to do this? So this QuickPoll can be either a widget or it can have its own page. So it is coming in multiple places. So, uh, but I, I didn't want to in, this to be interfaced with, I mean, um, yeah, this to interface with the rest of this thing. I still wanted to make this function. I have, I have all those functional, uh, functionality around it, you know, ability to view results there, change words and all those things. And if you go to the, So if you go to the individual QuickPoll, uh, QuickPoll see all page, there is multiple QuickPolls here. So if you select this, this should not be uh, interfer interfering with any of the rest of the components, right? Any rest of the QuickPoll unit. So we, what the best solution we found is to write a directive for that, which will essentially have its own control. So this is the directive. It takes as a, this is the template used for that. There is a scope object which operates, which is the QPOL and what is the project it is in. And it has its own, its own controller. And we do all the stuff there itself. Let's say, uh, if you want to, the response code, how you post the response back to the uh, server, how you, what will happen when you view the result. I'm all I'm doing is I'm changing a variable here. So if I, the view show is result, Angular ng if directly will uh, display that part. And the powers of that is does not end there. So you can also, uh, you know, right. So here I'm just resting it as an element. You can also write your own custom attributes and custom classes using that. So I will show you one uh, application we did, did that. So in the sign up form, so this is basically the input field for uh, user registering. So there we have the sign up form and it has this, uh, attribute called ng model. So this is basically a directive which comes as part of the Angular uh, core. So any any directives which is namespace with ng it comes with Angular core. So we can also name our directives ng but it is not a best practice to do that. So here we, I am uh, I am attaching, I am binding the model value, model variable to this uh, using this ng model attribute and I am using is unique login. So I, what I want to do that as soon as a user enter a login uh, screen name while you sign up for a form. I want to check whether it is unique. I want to go back to the server and check whether a user named already in that name is uh, exist or not. So there are a lot of uh, custom validator. I mean, there are a lot of validators which come with uh, Angular. ng required, ng min length is a uh, few of that, but this is uh, something which Angular does not ship with. So what we did is we wrote a custom directive which takes ng model as a requirement and uh, in the linking function of in the link function of uh, uh, is unique directive, I am injecting the controller of ng model directive. So after going checking with the API whether the current user is unique or not, I am setting using the set validity dollar set validity method of uh, ng model attribute. I mean ng model directive to be uh, true. So this unique valid unique validity is, is true if and only if the ba response back from the server if that uh, particular user is unique, we'll say that this as true. So here, I'm using the same directive for uh, 
uh, not just for login but also for account email so here the same same directory but i just said this is email we are checking if it is unique or not right so in cases where, so in some cases so this is all isolated from the rest so in, so in some cases we may want to uh, let other decoupled components know that something if something happens let's say we want to do some interface changes once this uh, unique validation check is or one, one this check is done in the server right so what we are doing is we are broadcasting a event called unique check we, along with the response we got from the server whether it is unique or and uh, and other parameters we have uh, so uh, usually uh, uh, events in uh, angular works in a scope level but in this case i'm broadcasting in root scope itself so every everything in the application will we can inject root scope and then look into it, uh, whether uh, uh, then use the using the dollar on method get that uh, you know even notification then. So uh, actually, this particular part helped us in creating a very unique experience in our mobile uh, sites. So if you uh, our site admins, if they choose to have uh, unverified user access, so as they are participating, not only registered users but even browsing users want to participate. We would just want to get their email ID and still allow them to participate in a particular survey or anything like that. But how would you know when a registered user is actually trying to take a survey, would you actually pull them away from the survey, show a login page and then bring them back to the survey? We didn't want to break that experience in there in that way. So what we did was we essentially used this unique function, broadcasted it, and the user has a seamless experience throughout. He just enters his email. Uh, the server would say this is not unique, we already have it, give him the password field right there, enters his password and from then on in that session, we have him as a registered user. So we don't really have to move between login screens and uh, change his uh, views. So what this that is, let us do is that essentially teach, you know, this is something I found in Twitter. Uh, so this, what this is essentially doing is that, you know, ex uh, extending the vocabulary of HTML. So as expressive as you write HTML, you have to just use H1 tag or P tag. Just like that, you can write all these complex interface components. Right. right. Uh, so again, going back to the complexity of the app itself, right? So within the same site, we had like multiple different projects. I've shown you different uh, the basic uh, information architecture. So you know there are different types of projects. It could there could be an open project, which is like any browsing user can get. Uh, access to the information put up on a project. We could have a protected project, which is like only registered users get access to this project. Or we could have a panel project, which is like the admins decide who are the set of users in the community who get access to the information on this project. And all these projects could lie under the same uh, site. So again, uh, this was uh, something that we had a block in terms of how do we go about this. So uh, what we essentially want to do was, you know, as soon as you, the client requests for a resource, uh, if the API refused to give that resource back, if the API responded with a status code, like a red status code, let's say unauthorized or protected, what we wanted to do, we want to let the client know what, what should do by then, right? So what we essentially want to do that before giving the response from the server to the application code, we want to intercept that response and take action based on the status code, right? So what we uh, we have this concept of uh, interceptors in Angular. What it essentially does do is that. So here I I'll show you how the access control work here. So we have a factory method which returns a method which takes a promise object uh, as a argument. So the dollar HTTP service in Angular, uh, which is used to do all all kind of AJAX requests or any kind of XHR request or not work based on this dollar queue implementation in the Angular code, which is basically a promise deferred implementation, right? So what it do is, here I am uh, taking the argument as in a promise object, and if it is not successful, if the, if I am using the then method to chain it, if the response was not successful, I am checking uh, if the status is either unauthorized or protected, or if it is not in the user login page, uh, I am essentially redirecting the user to sign in page if he is not logged in yet or I am just giving him a message redirecting some other page and uh, telling him this this particular resource is restricted for you. So if we are doing uh, checks in the UA as well to not show that link but in cases if you they use absolute URL to access something this kind of check is necessary. So uh, writing a method that is not like this is not enough we have to let know dollar uh, HTTP service that this, this this is an interceptor. So how you do that? Uh, you in the so coming back to the app.coffee 
in the application bootstrapping file i am injecting the dollar http provided here and there is an array called response interceptors so i'm essentially pu pushing the uh, access control interceptor that uh, interceptor into this array so as so what it will do is any response from server before getting uh, get, uh, the promise that pass, passed it to the application code it just runs this method first and here i am returning the promise object but it, you don't have to essentially do that in this case we don't want to do any modification here you can do modification to the promise object as well and return that as a promise object. all you have to do is you have to just return a promise object so we can do all kind of error handling any any sort of complex set using these interceptors it's very powerful yep so yeah today we didn't went into anything into detail but we touched upon these concepts it helped us a lot to make this project a reality and lot more which uh, actually angular have this uh, filters concept which is useful for any kind of you know transformation or preprocessing of your data before displaying in your uh, view so one example i can name is so before you uh, display block of test if there is a url you want it to be uh, a, a put inside a anger tag right so that user can click on that a url or a email address so we have a filters filter for that which will essentially uh, you can use the unix index the piping index so you pass it through that filter and it will essentially take it and i find all the uh, urls in that and just combine it with put it inside an anchor tag we use dollar watch for the dependent questions uh, feature of our of the survey tool which is essentially if a user answered this question then then only show the other question so we use the dollar watch in angular uh, to do that we use dollar eval to for the customizable tool name so we have all these customizable tool names in our application uh, to display that as well as um, to map the, the mobile url mobile url is different from our uh, desktop versions url so to map the mobile url with all the arguments parameters and not to the equivalent desktop alternative so that switch to desktop link works all the time right? yeah so do find us off stage and we're happy to share more code show us exam show you guys examples and talk about more of the stuff and we are very happy and, and thankful to these guys uh, who made their uh, awesome open source projects and finally uh, i'm praneet uh, i had the ux uh, at bang the table uh, and, and I'm Adil. Uh, I do front end development at Bank the Table. We would right. be happy to answer any questions. Just here. one thing before you start asking questions that the re whole reboot in terms of how we built and rebuilt, it was only Adil who was doing all that stuff. So it was <laughs> one resource throughout 86 days who got this app out into production. Yep. Yep. <laughs> questions? Okay, uh, then... That's uh, awesome. No? We either, they bought it all, or we just made yeah, fools it's of it's us. Easy. That's so, a yeah. win for you. That's okay. Uh, one other thing, we also want you guys to see the app that we built. So you could go to angulartalk.engagementhq.com. You could give us your feedback. There's a short survey, three question survey. You could actually use the app and see how it works. And uh, the other thing that we've been thinking through these few months is there's no local community for AngularJS. And we wanted to see if there's any interest for such. And we would be ho happy to host like a monthly event or maybe a make a fair show and tell kind of a thing where people can bring in their projects and talk about it and share about those. So it's angulartalk.engagementhq.com. Okay, all right. Uh, tweet it and we'll retweet it on the JS4 account. Everybody, big round of applause for Praneet and Thank Adil. You. Thank you. Thank you, guys.